Hi everyone. It's nice to see a lot of familiar faces, I think, in the in the uh, class list and roster. So nice to meet you all. This is really informal. I want it to feel like a conversation. And I also wanted to feel like you get what you wanted to get out of this course. So please let me know if there's something you want me to speak to. I talk about this all day long, so I probably have the answer somewhere or can get it or I might know it even. So please feel free to chime in anytime. My name's Emily Braley. I'm the manager of NV Rides, but today I'll be talking not just about NV Rides, but about like volunteer driving in general, because I think it's an interesting topic for all of us. We're talking about it as a tool for aging in place. So quick bio about me. I live in Vienna, so I'm very close. My office is in Fairfax. So I'm very close to Ollie actually, right around the corner on Little River Turnpike. I have three young boys. I have 18 month old twins and a four year old. Um, none of them are home now, so you won't hear any uh, squealing. Um, I'm a nurse and have been a nurse. That's the only career I've ever had. I graduated college and have been a nurse for a little bit more than 12 years. I've done a lot of different things in my nursing career. I did outpatient heart transplant. I did ER, I did ICU. I also managed a rare disease program at Stanford in Palo Alto. And um, I also, uh, my job immediately prior to this, I worked at California Medicaid uh, doing some case management. I did a lot of medical transportation in that job, as you could imagine. That's a huge part of that job. So I have a lot of knowledge about medical transportation that I've sort of parlayed into this job. Um, and then I had my twins in July of 2021 and moved back home. I'm from here. I went to Oakton High School um, and I managed NV Rides since uh, November of 2021. So it's a little bit more than a year. So this is a topic I'm really passionate about, obviously. So if, uh, I'm, I have lots to say, but also please interrupt me. And if you have anything you wanted to know about or you want me to go more in depth on, I can do so. And if you're really interested, I have a really good reading list, too. I've read a lot of the, the textbooks about this. So before I start, is there anybody who, you know, wants to share why they signed up or there's anything you really absolutely have to know, you'll walk away disappointed if you don't find out anybody had experience with volunteer driving in their own life and you want to share that? Okay, well, I will, oh, I see, I see somebody hopping into the chat. How do you screen drivers? That's a great question. That will be coming up in this talk. And um, the brief answer is we're going to do, we do background checks. We do a motor vehicle record check and a criminal background check. Um, but there's a lot more that can go into it um, depending on the scenario. Like um, we, def we definitely try and not use people who need community service hours, obviously, but sometimes you can learn more about their motivations and that's a good way to screen people. A really good question. Definitely one of our top. There's a couple top questions I got when I've given talks like this, and I try and cover them here, but sometimes like there's different, you know, people have certain things they want to know about. So please jump in. Uh, so here's a quick agenda. We're going to talk about what volunteer driving is, who we serve, who our drivers are, what, what does it do, and what is it really not good for? What's it really good for? Um, what does it look like here in Northern Virginia in 2023? Um, oh, somebody else hopped in the chat. Let's see. Um, to learn how to use the service here in Fairfax. Okay, so some people, yeah. So I'll talk about how how this how this program works here and how it works in different areas. We're in all four counties of Northern Virginia, as defined by the census, not defined by people's feelings. So unfortunately, Fauquier County is not in our group, even though I think sometimes Fauquier could count, you know, that area. But it's only uh, Loudon, Prince William, Fairfax, and Arlington. Um, I'll cover some special considerations like insurance, rider and driver selection, and then I'll cover how how the, how you could make this happen in your community and how 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 these programs are set up, how to start it. Um, and I'm happy to you know coach people more on that too. It's something I've now done twice, and um, I'm certainly not the most experienced, but I've learned some things in my process of doing this. So that's our agenda. Obviously, flexible. So the first thing I'll talk about is aging in place, because I think it's a word we hear a lot, but I think the, the definition can be um, can be confusing because there's a lot of different things you can do to quote unquote age in place. So this is how like the textbook definition, I took a course last semester, this was in the textbook, when a person lives and ages in their residence of choice for as long as they're able to, 
It includes services, care, and support in the residence. So it would be staying in your home while you undergo the changes of aging. Um, that's the textbook definition. But sometimes people feel like aging in place is like staying in your home community, but maybe moving to an apartment. That also can be aging in place. Some people feel like aging in place is moving into a child's home in their community. Probably also counts. It's more like aging in place is when people have the autonomy to make choices to age where they want to age. And that's usually in your own home. So 90% of seniors want to age in their own community. But we'll find out why that's hard. And the biggest uh, areas that ARP mentions and that I hear all the time in this work are housing, healthcare needs. Um, the biggest one is probably the biggest two, I think. I highlighted transportation because I know a lot about it. But the other one is, is personal care and custodial care. You know, Medicare doesn't cover those um, like light housekeeping, bathing, getting dressed kind of things that are really challenging to do. And so those are big reasons that people move into assisted living is transportation and then custodial care. Um, and then I think another big need that is sometimes neglected in these discussions is we have all have a socialization need and need for community. I think it varies by person and personality, but I think all of us want to be connected to one another. And so part of aging in place is figuring out how to maintain those connections across space, time, changing health needs. And so you'll see like aging in place requires a lot of prior planning. You have to have an idea of, you know, contingency plans, backup plans, worst case, best case, likely case. You know, what happens if I fall? What happens if I have to have a surgery? What happens if my vision's changing? Um, and you have to have an idea kind of before, obviously the resources come about, right? Re NV Ride's only been around since 2014, but there's, you have to have some idea of what you're going to do or what your backup plan might be. So this is a question that I've, I've brought to different audiences and gotten really different answers. So I'm curious what you guys think in this, in Fairfax, maybe, um, what do you need in your community to age in place? What are things that you're looking for? that you would put on your checklist to make your it make it possible for you. So some answers I've gotten, I've, I've, I've brought this question to different audiences. In, in Richmond, a big one was people wanted community centers. It was really interesting. People were like, there's no, there's no third place to gather. It's like, if it's not church or my house, there's nowhere to go. And so people wanted like casual places to play games. I think we're really lucky in Fairfax that we have a lot of those. Like that's a huge strength of Fairfax. Um, but that's something that people look for and consider when they decide where to retire. So good for Fairfax for building those. <laughs> uh, my parents had the hardest time aging in place because of socialization. Yeah, it's interesting. I think we plan to age in place a lot about like healthcare, finances, like do I have the money to pay for an aid, which is really important and not should not be neglected. But I think people don't realize how much we this need for connection is just as important as we age, it doesn't change. Um, so yeah, I totally agree. I think socialization options, uh, ability to get together in like third places like coffee shops or libraries or senior centers. So those are some resources people definitely wanna consider. Um, so I'll, I'll talk about transportation because that's, the, that's what we're talking about today, but there's a lot of, you could go on any of these topics. Oh, somebody has a chat, let's see. Reliable companies that provide custodial care services. Yeah, that's a big one. Um, there have been major labor shortages. I'm actually speaking at a career fair in two weeks and it's interesting, all of the career openings are for like CNAs, personal aides. It's just a huge, huge market that needs to be filled. So I'm, I'm de I definitely get that. It's hard to find somebody to come at the same time every day, et cetera. Um, so transportation is a huge barrier to aging in place after the you know finances custodial care this is, comes up a lot um so you know men will outlive their ability to drive by about six years and women by 10 years so you're going to have a long time when you can't drive but you're still otherwise like you know you're having a great time right you're still doing fun stuff um so about only about 15 percent of older drivers are considered at risk for unsafe driving and the number one diagnosis is dementia that's like Every textbook, every piece of literature mentions dementia as the number one cause. Um, but about 50% of, of after that, about 50% of concerns will also mention hearing and seeing. So like you could drive, but just the vision is not there. Um, you know, you have to be able to hear to drive um, or have some level of hearing actually legally I learned in this job. So um, that's a problem as well. 
but because of the way our country is set up, you know, we live in like kind of a giant suburb, um, still uh, private vehicles remain the most common way. 89% of trips for seniors still occur in private vehicles. So it's not like people are shifting to the metro or to a bus system. It's just not as robust as it could be. So driving remains really important. Even if you can't do it, it's still the way to get around the communities that we live in. Maybe that'll change, but right now that's that's our that's our infrastructure in this country. Um, so there's a there's a bunch of surveys and research about this, but these were some facts I thought were interesting. So 70% of caregivers said that they felt nervous about their loved one for more than a year before they got them to stop driving. So it's it can be a, a scary time for people. They have this whole like they notice it. How do I communicate it? What am I communicate it? What am I gonna do? Um so most people who identify the problem are, are close relatives. 79% are relatives that live within a, half, within a half hour. So you're thinking like daughters, nieces, friends. Um, the common tip-offs that someone shouldn't drive, this is an order of frequency. So the first one is just observ observation of the driver, like seeing them drive, it's not looking good. They're not turning their head all the way, that kind of thing. Uh, damage to the vehicle, so minor like fender bendery kind of things. The third most common one is actually passenger comments. So somebody said, I, I didn't really feel comfortable with her merging on the highway. I didn't like the way that that happened. And then the, unfortunately the most, the least common, but the most scary to all of us would be like a car accident. So that's not the most common way people find out they're not gonna drive. Um, so this is a comic that I like to show. I think it illustrates well, this guy's talking to his dad. He's like, you can't drive anymore for, you know, whatever reason. And the dad's sort of, his thought bubble is that he it feels like he's being treated like a baby or like a kid. Um, and I think it speaks to how important driving is for independence in our society. I mean, that it represents starting adulthood, right? You get a license when you're 16. Um, it feels very integral to people's identity. And I think, I mean, what kind of car you drive, people feel like is a personality trait, right? Like, you know, I, I drive this, I drive that. But I think it's hard to have that conversation. One of our driver volunteers, I don't know if he's in this meeting, he said that he talked to a, a family member about stopping driving. And he said, the doctor said, it's harder to tell someone they can't drive than it is to tell them they have cancer. It's so hard to tell someone you you I, you can't drive because it's such a loss of personal autonomy in our society. So it was interesting that he brought that up. And I think that's part of what makes this conversation hard. But I think it's also, we, we present an opportunity with Envy Rides. I think we're helping to create a world where people don't have to drive to live in their home. So what happens when seniors stop driving? Um, you know, loneliness, difficulty getting basic things. Um, and 54% of people who don't drive don't leave their home on a given day because it's like really hard to go anywhere. We live in these houses that are not really close together. So here's what people do when they don't drive anymore. Uh, public transit, paratransit, friends and neighbors, family members, taxis, Uber, Lyft. And then um, luckily, one good thing that came out of the pandemic has been more telehealth, like things where you're just going to have a conversation with the doctor um, or you're getting like test results or something have moved to more telehealth, which I think is really convenient for people and totally reasonable for a lot of appointments. Um, so here's our rider profile. So we serve people who want to age in place. We're not super appropriate for people living in assisted living, nursing facilities, or other congregate living arrangements, typically because it's a higher level of care than a volunteer driver would usually offer. Um, and the good thing about assisted living is they often have shuttles and they often have like, they, they sort of plan for this. That's why people move into them. Uh, we obviously have more females than male. That represents just the demographic of aging in, in the world, not just in America. Um, they usually, most of our riders make too much for free transit, but maybe couldn't afford the paid services or they do some paid services, some envy rides, some um, family members, like kind of a patchwork, uh, typically older than 80. Um, and our data, not just from our program, this is from a national database, so I, I don't actually know the data for our program because it would be really hard for me to collect, but it allows people about 18 months longer to stay in their homes. So it's not something that, you know, people necessarily use for 10 years. Eventually their needs exceed our capacity, but it allows people, volunteer driving programs allow people 18 months on average longer in their own home. I suspect ours is a little bit better here, but I don't know. I don't have a way of collecting that easily without really getting like granular. 
So I like this quote a lot. Our connection to others is what binds us to life. And that's a, we talked about that before, but social connection is really important. So what volunteer rides mean to our riders? Most of our riders live alone. Like I can tell you almost all of them do. Uh, so the driver might be the only person they see that day. And there's a, there's a lot of gratitude. People are very grateful for the people that take them where they need to go. It's really rewarding. This is a quote I got last year off of our survey. We do a survey every year of riders and driver, drivers to see like how are we doing? Um, and this person wrote this in and I typed it because it was so beautiful. Um, I have no family. My once a week ride to the store is that are special for me. I appreciate the kind volunteers who get me in the world and I see life around me. So incredibly meaningful. Um, and 94% of our riders say volunteer rides are very important to them. So they are very grateful for our volunteers. So this is my destinations chart. Um, it's about 80% medical, about 16% grocery. It varies by what the supply chain is doing. I'm curious if the eggs thing that's going on right now is gonna affect our, our grocery runs, if people are gonna do less Instacart and wanna go to the grocery store more because they're always out of eggs. About 2% job, interview, career, and then the other 2% that's not on there is like socialization type things. I lump it all in like exercise, game, socializing. So do you have any thoughts on what top destinations might be in your neighborhood? I'm always curious. Like some people will tell me like, oh yeah, there's a certain grocery store or pharmacy or something. Is there anywhere you would think would be like, this would be my preferred destination as a beach, but um, do you guys have anything that you think would be a, a hot destination? Let's see the library. Yeah, that's, that's a big one. Walmart. Yeah, Walmart. Yep, definitely. Jan. Jan knows volunteer transportation. Well, Walmart's huge. You can get everything there. Um, the Chantilly Costco, really big. Don't know why, but popular. Maybe it has good parking. Um, it, all the Innova like conglomerate of facilities that's kind of on, I think off Gallows Road is what is our top destination across our whole network. Uh, medical appointments. Yeah, that's a big one. Yeah, it's interesting. There's like, it kind of varies by location. Uh, so more about destinations. The number one request is always medical. That's with all of our programs. Um, but we did have big dips during the pandemic. I think during that whole supply chain crisis, um, we were down to 68% um, medical and like these massive increase in like grocery errand type things. Um, so I think it was just like, you couldn't reliably use Amazon. People had to go to the store. So that became big. Um, and the numbers are just, um, they're not the requests. So that's one thing I don't have a way of tracking requests. Um, so that's just a, a point of fact is that this is the rides that happen. So I do think there's probably more requests coming in that the partner organizations triage away um, because they they can't maybe can't fill it or it's just not going to happen. So, um, you know, they, they're going to prioritize the medical like life sustaining destinations. Um, and our average one-way trip is nine miles. It does vary a little bit by county, but that's across the whole region. I think in Arlington, it's pretty short. I wanna say it was like three or four miles. So it just depends on how much you can get to in a short distance. So our drivers volunteer to drive in their community. Um, they use a ride scheduling software to accept rides based on their availability. It's always their availability, not the, not the riders. Um, they do use their own gas and vehicles and they can track the mileage and volunteer hours in our software and then they can um, use it for tax purposes. I think in April we'll be busy again printing those out. Average age is 68, about equal male and female. Um, often caregivers, we have a lot of people who care who did caregiving maybe for someone who passed away or maybe their parent lives in another state, but they kind of have done caregiving. Um, very motivated by desire for similar programs to exist. <laughs> so kind of understanding you have to pay it forward if you want this to exist when you're older um, and really personable and caring. And we find a lot of our volunteers do other volunteer work. So it's very, a lot of overlap. Like I go to the farmer's market and I meet the farmer's market volunteer also is our driver sometimes. So it, a lot of people doing a lot of volunteering and we're one of the things they do. 
So does anybody have any questions before I hop into what it looks like here in Nova? I want to give people a chance. Comments. <laughs> I'm open to comments too, feedback, negative or positive. Okay. So what does it look like here in Nova in 2023? So this was our last year, 23,273 rides, visits, and deliveries. About 16,000 of those were people rides, driving a person somewhere. The rest were like food bank runs, errands, um, friendly visitors, friendly calls, um, a tiny bit of handy helper, like light bulb changing, internet router plugging in kind of stuff. Are there any husband wife team who are volunteering? Yes, there are. Um, they both have background checks, but one person will do the... Um, the grocery shopping and another person sometimes hangs out. Um, sometimes they both grocery shop and they have a, they have a rider with them just to do a good deed. Um, but yes, absolutely. There's also a, a mother daughter team, actually. I don't know if they drive together, but they both are drivers <laughs> that I can think of. Um, so yeah, you don't have to definitely don't have to do it yourself as long as everybody's background checked. We don't allow any kids in the car, but that's probably obvious. Um, I should say the drivers can have kids in the car, but none of the riders can have kids. They can't bring minors. Because the car seat law is in Virginia and around the country now. Um, so we are a network. We have 16 partners throughout the region. Each serves its own geography or population and sets its own rules. They can decide what they wanna do. I did mention we're in all four counties and some groups do more. Like some of our programs will do like village events. They do lunch and life at the Shepherd Centers. They'll do their own charity events. Um, so it, it varies a lot. It's a lot of times the volunteer rides program is nestled within a, a big program of other community outreach short service type programs. Uh, we are the hub, so to speak. So I don't directly have anybody volunteering for me, but we do fund where we do ads campaigns to try and find volunteers. We pay for background checks. We have we pay for the software. Um, I do a lot of organized advocacy. You guys might have seen me in the Commission on Aging and all the different counties I work in. The, I'm again I'm on the Virginia Governor's Council on Aging. Um, I go to a lot of Transportation Commission meetings to try and make sure that people know that a we exist, but also like what we need. And so a lot of times we can have help recruiting volunteers. We can increase awareness. Um, a lot of my role is to bring this to the public every way I can because people, when they hear about it, are really enthusiastic, but I have to get it there. Um, we do a lot of coordination with some of the public transit programs, um, including like STAR and Arlington, the STAR cabs. Um, I go to a lot of Omni Rides meetings in Prince William, the TAPS program in Fairfax. So just everything, I'm trying to find out who, what the landscape is and how we can work together. And we do I get a lot of phone calls um, from people around the region looking for rides and we can't always help them, but we at least know who to call. So we do share common high level rules, like all 16 partners at a high level share the same rules. Uh, we have quarterly meetings. I have an advisory council that I kind of answer to that they're um, leaders in the aging community. If anybody's interested, please email me because we're actually expanding. We have like 10 members and we're going to add two more. Uh, we respond as a group to ongoing concerns, um, and we do communal volunteer recruitment, which helps all of us. So in the future directions, we have a certain geography that I just have been working day and night to see if I can help. And um, I always put this out there. We really need the Fairfax side of Alexandria. Very hard for me to serve that area currently. Obviously, um, we always need volunteers, and you probably could guess this, but nationwide, I'm part of a nationwide network, and supply is always less than demand. There's always more demand than supply, so we're always looking for volunteers. And then I hate to say this, but sometimes succession planning, like because people might want to retire from their volunteer job or cut back or move to Florida even. Um, so who's going to take over next and uh, making sure we have robust uh, networks of people interested in sustaining these programs. So that's what it looks like here. That's Northern Virginia 2023. Um, but one thing I've done in this job that's been interesting has been working with programs all over the country. And I'll talk about that later in this talk, but there's so many ways to do this and they're all valid and they all work in that community. So that's just here in Nova, that's how we work. I inherited this program that was fabulous and functional and gets everybody where they need to go, but there's lots of ways to do it. We're just one way. So special considerations, these are always the questions I get. So I figured I'd throw them in here. So I'll talk about driver's insurance. 
organizational slash sometimes it's called umbrella insurance and then some best practices and risk reduction strategies for a program like this. So drivers always have their own car insurance. Obviously, if you're driving in Virginia, it is illegal to drive without car insurance. So hopefully you have it. Um, it needs to meet state standards, um, but we always verify this because uh, DC Metro Virginia area is very unique in that people may have lived in Maryland last, moved here, they feel like it was a local move, but you actually need a new license and new car insurance. So we always verify that. Um, they have to have a valid driver's license. They need to be 21. Um, some programs even say 25, they gotta be that rental car age. So it's gonna be more of an older, we're not looking in like high schools and colleges to recruit volunteer drivers. Uh, they have to sign a criminal and motor vehicle background check. We pay for it, it's not at cost to the volunteer, they just have to consent to it. And it's online, it's very simple. Uh, obviously if they have more than six points, they typically can't volunteer. We don't get people driving records applying because usually you know if your driving record's not good and you would pick another volunteer opportunity. Um, we do follow the Fairfax County volunteer policies in all four of our counties, which are pretty, pretty simple. Basically, you know, we don't accept people doing community service hours. Uh, you have to have a pretty clean license. You have to have a valid license, you know, no, nothing on the criminal background check, really simple stuff. Um, if there is something that shows up in the criminal background check, they do take it case by case, but in general, we're pretty cautious, like DUIs, DU, DWIs, anything like that are a no, obviously reckless and no, um, you know, it, certain things, maybe if it was in the, the distant past, but generally pretty clean driving record. Um, people who apply for this volunteer opportunity tend to enjoy driving. So they tend to be the safe drivers who like who actually enjoy it. A lot of people do. Um, so organizations have to have umbrellas insurance that covers things that are not under auto insurance. So for example, things that occur outside the car, obviously people's car insurance doesn't cover. Um, they need to have a comprehensive risk strategy, driver training, um, setting expectations is super important. And I'll talk about that a little bit more. Uh, background checks uh, here in Northern Virginia, NV Rides funds them, but in other states, that's actually a big part of their, their budget is like they set aside how much they're going to spend per volunteer background check um, and then contingency plans. So here's some best practices that I'll kind of go over some of that. So these sound really simple. And I think when you hear them, you'll be like, why do you tell people that? That's like obvious. But I think Sometimes just communicating it makes, reminds people. It's the reason that, you know, obviously people take defensive driving classes. They know what the defensive driving teacher is telling them, but hearing it articulated, you're like, oh yeah, that makes sense. I'm gonna remember to do that. So keeping it front of mind is the reason we go over this with drivers, even though it's obvious to most of us. So um, always seatbelts buckle before the car moves. Um, you say, always, could you hear the click? Then you can start driving. Um, that just reduces accidents, uh, increases safety by about 40%, reduces the risk of an injury by about 40% for seniors. So like the most important thing you can do is just put a seatbelt on everybody. Um, we confirm the destination each trip, each time. This has, when you, when you don't do this, you end up with really funny things happening. So always good. This area is changing a lot. There's a lot of construction. Always confirm you're going to such and such doctor. It's located here. I'm gonna drive, like this is generally how I'm gonna go there and make sure the person knows. Um, we allow conversation, that's part of the fun, right? The connection, listen to music, whatever, podcast. Um, but we never, we tell our drivers, you can never offer medical advice or referrals to a service like realtors or like, oh, um, you should see such and such podiatrist. That sounds like this. We never wanna be giving advice. Um, we ask the coordinators and organizations, yes, be really clear what's in the request because <laughs> that way people, don't pick up things that are not reasonable for them. Um, and then we always empower our drivers to make sure that they can reach out. Like if you're concerned about safety, if you see ice on your driveway and you don't wanna leave the house that day, totally fine. It's always at the driver's discretion. Sometimes part of being part of a volunteer rides program is you might miss the appointment because the weather's bad, but also like we wanna put safety first. So we empower our drivers a lot to speak up if they don't feel safe. Um, likewise, if they get to the person's house and they don't feel like they could get to the house, then it's also okay for them to back up. If they get there and it's like a really steep gravel driveway, they're worried they can't get out of, it's okay for them to say no. 
part of our risk management strategy is empowering the drivers to say when they feel uncomfortable. Uh, we provide really clear guidelines and training. So like, here's what you can do. Here's what you can't do. Here's the scope of what you're allowed to do. We have clear agreements with clients and drivers, um, very clear, like what you're allowed to do and they can sign them and then we're totally fine. Um, we set expectations with riders up front. This is probably our most important is making is client selection. Um, and I'll talk about that a little bit, but making sure people expect you know, what a volunteer rides program can do, they're ex expecting, they're not expecting more than that. All the requests go through a coordinator. That's to protect everybody's time and to make sure everything's well documented. Um, and then we just refresh records every six months. That's the interval that I would recommend, I like, is because that's how often auto insurance, like, is a new term usually, like you pay again. So it's a good time to check in on everybody every time their car insurance, you know, re-ups, you can get a new copy, check in on them. So does anybody have any questions on this, on the, what I just talked about? It's probably my most, I talk to a lot of potential volunteers, which is really fun and rewarding. And those are the questions that come up like right away. Like the first thing they say is like, what's, how does insurance work? How are you going to train me? And so it's helpful to have like kind of the experience of doing it. And I think it's also reassuring to both parties like everybody's trained this is this is formal this is a real organization you're not like going on Facebook and saying can someone give me a ride awesome well that was those are like my top questions so this is about riders and this is um you know we get of all the calls I get I'll to be honest we get a lot more calls for people who need rides than our drivers but um but we we what kind of trainings offer it's a great question so each organization sets it up but it has usually it's it's one-to-one. -one. That's how I typically train people. Um, and we go over guidelines, um, like, you know, what you're allowed to do and what you're not allowed to do. We go over our software because it's very user-friendly, but it's very helpful to have a chance to like take a tour and see how you pick a ride. Um, we go over destinations. We make sure that they have, like, if they're not from the area, we'll say like, okay, you know, here's, this is what Vienna looks like. These are the roads you'll probably be using a lot. You know, this is the toll road, that kind of thing. Um, and we'll orient people to like where maybe the drivers live. Like this area is mostly townhouses. You can wait here. This area is, you know, an apartment complex. There's a circle. So I kind of try and give people like an overview of where, where people go. We don't do big areas. So it's helpful to kind of go over what what it's going to look like. Um, and then we let them pick a ride and see if they have any questions. Usually it's pretty straightforward, um, but it's always good. I think sometimes it's good for like a first time driver to go with like a very experienced rider because the rider can sort of guide them a little bit like, oh, so-and-so usually does this, or I'm going to, you know, buckle my seatbelt, wait, wait a second, that kind of thing. Um, so will you talk about whether volunteers? Okay, that's a great question. Jack, I will definitely talk about that. I can talk to it now a little bit. So the answer to that is sometimes. And it's definitely up to the organization and driver's discretion. We always want to empower drivers. And so if somebody picks up a ride to take someone to an appointment, you know, and they decide to do it, they can only pick up one leg of it. That's how the organization is going to get it covered and they need to go get a kid or, you know, they need to run an errand or go to their own doctor, that's okay. We always empower the drivers. If that's all they can do that day and somebody else is going to do the other leg or the person has a cab or whatever, that's okay. So we don't promise that you're going to get a, like an escort through the door. I mean, that's not, that's not what the service is about. Um, if the person, if the driver finds it convenient, absolutely. A lot of times grocery runs, if you're going to giant, you may as well knock it all out, right? Like you're already there. Let's just shop at the same time. Um, but, and then in terms of doctor's offices, I would say it's sometimes they can, but some doctor's offices, you know, with COVID had very limited visiting. And then it just, honestly, they're not a family member. They can't go in and take notes on the visit with you or anything, or, or you know, move you into the visit. Um, so we'll talk about that a little bit in rider circumstances, but generally we would say riders need to be fairly independent. Um, and it's a really nice bonus and it's fun to go with someone else, but they would need to be able to generally handle the tasks that they're going to do. I mean, maybe the person's opening doors or helping them, you know, maybe put a cane in the back seat, but not, um, not physically like doing, you know, doing that for them. 
Um, does a driver need any additional coverage? So it is not considered a ride share. No, they don't need it. And they need to have coverage that meets the standards, but they don't need like extra coverage. My greatest concern can drive us. Yeah, so Sarah, that's a great question. It has happened. Now, most of the time, and I'll talk about this too, a lot of our programs do home visits before they accept someone. So they know exactly how mobile that person is. So you're not getting there and the person's like, oh, actually I'm in a cast or something. You know, They try and stay in good communication with their clients and not take on clients who are um, you know, in need of like more assistance than advertised. And drivers can decline a client. We would never ever tell any, we would never hold it against the driver if they got there and said, I don't think this is safe because safety is our first priority. So you know, even up to the moment of, if you get down your driveway and you're like, oh, the entire street is a block of ice, you know, then you just have to call and say, I'm calling this off today. You know, it's, this is not safe. Um, things happen. We try and be as reliable as we can, but our number one priority is always safety. And we don't, you know, we don't lift or move clients and we definitely don't want to, I think a big one people feel is like inclement weather. And they're like, oh, you know, I feel bad. The person needs to go there, but if it's not safe for you, you don't want to be on the road. So does a driver get more than one rider? So Stephen, that's a really good question, um, sort of. So some people will ride with like a, a partner, like a, I'll quite honestly, husband, wife would be the most common scenario where they both don't drive, but need to go, you know, maybe to a doctor's appointment or they both want to pick their groceries. Um, but they, it's not like Uber, like ride sharing where you would get multiple people. It would be within the same household. That sometimes happens. But there's no, it wouldn't be like going from neighbor to neighbor. I actually think that in the future, that would be a really good idea. I just have to figure out a way to get the software and the privacy and all that. But I've thought about it. I'm like, there's a bunch of people in this like condo complex who all need to get groceries. Like it might be fun, but um, it's something I have to think about more. It's definitely not something we do now. Those are really good questions, you guys. Are very thoughtful questions. Um, so the, the special rider circumstances are, um, oops, sorry. Yeah, things that are just to know about riders, basically. So the number one question I get for rides, funny enough, other than medical is sedation because things you need to get picked up. And I can just say that is, you know, I can blanket say that is beyond the scope of volunteer driving programs. Um, as someone who used to be a practicing RN, um, you know, when, when a doctor asks you to be signed out of a colonoscopy by a family member and not a cab driver, it's because there's an expectation that someone will be with you at your home. Um, so obviously this would be, you know, our drivers are more of a curb to curb type service. They're not going to go and wait with you for four hours at your home. So this is not something that's appropriate. I do want to bring up this one program I found really interesting. I've talk to them a lot, more just like to learn from each other. It's called Trusted Ride LLC. Um, the guy who started it is a former like HHS person. So he's, he, he knows a lot. I think he worked for CMS and HHS before. He's in DC, but the program's not in DC for whatever reason. But it's a, um, it's a model that does this. So he trains like nursing students and medical students to accompany people home from procedures and they use like a lift in an uber essentially so it's not a driving program it's really a volunteer like caregiving program um it's in baltimore it's in new hampshire i think so it's not not here but it was an interesting model and i spoke with him because i was like this is really cool but the training is significant right like everybody's cpr certified it's a really big lift and it's definitely not something i could do by myself as a one person uh, show but it's interesting to know that it exists out there and it also helped to inform me like what what it would take to do such a program so it was educational in that way and his name is um alan lopaden i've spoken with him a bunch he's really interesting um He's very knowledgeable and this program does exist out there in the world. It's just not here in the DC area. Um, so wheelchairs, I work with a lot of volunteer rides programs. As I mentioned, I'm in a course and I actually meet with them every month as a nationwide group. Um, and almost all of the thing them don't use wheelchairs. And that's because private vehicles just typically are too small. <laughs> um, like they, you know, most of us don't have a car that could accommodate a wheelchair. And we also don't provide lift transfer mobility assistance. And then you need some medical training. Um, part of my nursing school was learning how to safely transfer people. And I now realize that is a skill. You cannot just have somebody just do that. They, everybody can get injured, uh, both driver and uh, wheelchair user. 
I always get the question when I bring this up, what about folding wheelchairs? And it's still a no because of the, like, honestly, just the like mobility. Um, we can't do that. But it's a, and, it, and I, it's common to volunteer rides programs around the country. The ones that do do it have a wheelchair van and a specially trained driver. So um, we just don't own that equipment currently. Um, so we talk about all of our riders need to be independent. It's a complex definition, but generally we have to imagine what happens if the trip is divided into two legs? Is the person okay there unaccompanied? And that's how I think of it. Um, so they need to be able to generally get into where they're going, you know, maybe handle a copay if applicable, communicate with whoever they need to take the elevator, you know, as needed. Um, so that's sort of how we define it. Like, okay, the driver has to go. Is this, a, is this a safe scenario? And like I said, a lot of our programs do do a home visit before they accept the client, just to make sure that the house is, you know, where, they, where, where they thought it was and the person is what they thought they were. Um, so mobility assists like canes and walkers. Oh, my video worked. I was <laughs> pleasantly surprised. Um, they do work if they if the person can self stow or you know stow with minimal assistance in fitted or Prius or something. We have one Miata in the program, but um, so clients and relationships. This is huge. I've talked about this a lot, but I think it's worth mentioning again is that. Um, one of the best ways to reduce liability, increase satisfaction of everybody is to have these relationships. That's why we have these local communities of driving. We're not just one big thing. So all requests have to come from existing clients. People have to put in an application, sign an agreement, um, be somewhat vetted and form a community. Like it's driving a neighbor. Uh, in the case of a medical payments driver, wait for the ride. So they, sometimes they do and, and sometimes they don't. It depends on how hard the ride is to cover. Like, for example, if the person's driving to like the VA in DC, which has happened, we don't get many, we can't do many of those, but um, the person might not be able to wait because they don't want to pay to park and wait and stuff. So sometimes somebody else gets them. Sometimes it's round trip. It, it just varies. It's not, um, it is not necessarily that the person will wait with the person. Often they do, but it's not guaranteed. It really depends on the destination and time of day. Like rush hour is a huge factor in all of this as those of us who know the DC area. <laughs> um, and parking, like whether or not you can, you know, wait there, or you're gonna have to pay or the client gonna have to pay or whatever. So um, just kind of varies. It's not guaranteed, but they definitely do. And they definitely don't in some scenarios. Um, so agreements, relationships, community, friendships. I think one of the best parts about our program is that people have like a driver and rider relationship that are like real friendships, like genuine friendships um, from an authentic place of caring for one another. And I love that. So that's a huge part of our community building. Um, and we always try and ask for like at least a five to seven day notice. Um, we're not an on-demand service. The volunteers don't want to feel like they're Uber. They want to feel like they're really caring for someone and their neighbor. So um we have to form those relationships over time. And that really helps keeps the pro keeps everybody engaged and helps the program grow. We can do more rides that way. So feel free to jump in with questions. I'm very like informal. Um, but I want to talk a little bit about if you wanted to bring this to, to your community. So there's two main ways that our programs oh somebody has a chat. Oh, somebody says advise the audience what the question is. And uh, JIT, yes, uh, JIT asks, is a recording of the presentation available? And the answer is yes. Mike um, from Ali is recording me. So you can absolutely reference this at any time. And I'm, I'll give you guys my email too. Let me drop that here. Okay. So there's two main choices for how these programs have formed in my experience is an existing organization like uh, Reston Community Center says, you know what, let's add a volunteer rides program. Awesome, we can do that. The other way I've seen them formed is a small group of people are like, let's just do volunteer driving. Let's just start a group and do volunteer driving. So those are the two ways that I've seen these programs form. And there's no right or wrong, they both work. So my advice is to start small with people who know each other, like an HOA, a church, even like a friend group. Um, the, it's good to start where the drivers and riders like at least know each other somewhat. Acquaintances live in the same neighborhood, could plausibly run into each other and do very local destinations. See, so show that it can work within like two miles, right? 
And then you can show, you know, you can do the big trips. Uh, so you want to make a plan and typically like you need like a board or some group to come together. Um, trip guidelines, where, when, how often, any special prohibitions. I know one that comes up every time I talk about this is, do we do airport trips? Do we do restaurant deliveries? Do we do like, um, you know, pharmacy deliveries, that kind of thing? Because there's, there's things to think about. There's no right or wrong answer, but you should have a policy. Uh, risk mitigation, you're going to want to buy umbrella insurance, um, background checks, have some way of paying or have the volunteers pay, uh, verifying their license and insurance, like taking a look at it. And then I think an important factor that I, I, I want to emphasize is software and data management is crucial. Like, where are you entering all this information? Are you using Excel? Are you using software like we have? Are you using a shared Google Doc? But you need somewhere to, to write it all down. Uh, and then this one I'll emphasize because it's so important is transportation coordinator is essential. This does not have to be a paid person, but you need someone to take the requests. And um, it's more it's more time consuming than you would think because you need someone to like either take them off the phone or emails and like enter them in and email them to the drivers. Um, so you're going to want some software or Excel or email or something to enter it. It's a great position for someone who's homebound. You don't need to drive to volunteer. Um, so someone says, I'd love to know what software you use for managing our rides. It's called Ride Scheduler, uh, two words, and we're very happy with it. It's pretty simple. Um, I've been able to train people in like less than an hour, and um, it is all computer-based, cloud-based. You're not doing any um, texting or calling, which is nice. <laughs> Um, so yeah, you need it. You need a transportation coordinator it does not need to be paid, but you know, you need somebody to take the request. It's a great position for somebody who's homebound, but really wants to make a big impact. Um, and then all the communications we always ask go through our coordinator. So like if the person's in the car with someone like, oh, Mr. Jones, how, nice, to, nice trip today. I'll see you in two weeks. Um, and he says, oh, you know what? I need to go to the giant next week. You, you don't take the driver shouldn't take that request. We say, okay, go ahead and call the transportation coordinator. And that way it all is like documented and the driver doesn't feel put on the spot if they happen to be like, you know, out of town then or maybe unavailable or something. So volunteer recruitment, big part of my job, probably the most fun. I love this. It's fun to talk to people. So it's a challenge. Every program, there's more demand than supply, like I mentioned. And we need constant recruitment because people move and, you know, we need to maintain those relationships. What works really well is in person, things like this or like fairs or um, HOAs, um, just talking to people. When you post it online, a lot of times people are like, is that a paid driving opportunity? Do you need a CDL? You know, and it's like hard to explain because it's it's a different type of volunteering opportunity. So really great to get a chance to like talk to people about it. Um, we do use Facebook. I've done Google ads. I've, you know, I bought ads before, um, but in-person and expos and stuff are awesome. Speaking at a job fair like I'm doing in a few weeks will be awesome for us. Um, so the first question is people always ask about risk and insurance. So I talked about it here. I have a more of an elevator pitch when I'm not giving a lecture. Uh, social groups like invited talks. I spoke to NARFI, um, the federal employees group a couple weeks ago, and it was fabulous. They had great questions. Um, and then I always say to find a volunteer, look for people who are volunteering, volunteer fairs, you know, people serving in different things in their church. Those kinds of people are often willing to help out. These are some of the ideas I've done that are fun if you're trying to recruit volunteers like farmers markets. I've done brochures. I have brochures at Ollie, actually. Fun fact, I met Mike there before. Caregiver and senior interest groups, invited talks, expos, and then word of mouth. Um, if you go to Dunkin' Donuts, you might see my little ad. I have like, I put up cards on a lot of Dunkin' Donuts bulletin boards. I have a big coffee drinker, so it's a good excuse. I'm like, I have like 10 of these. Oh. Here we go. So different program models. I think this is fun to end with because there are so many different ways this is done around our country. And I think it's good to know that we're not doing it the only we're not the way I'm doing it is not the only way it's possible to make this happen. Um, so here are the programs that I've worked really closely with. And anybody, I'd love to know if anybody knows of another. Every time I give a talk, somebody's like, oh yeah, like my mom had this in Texas and it was like this. So I love to hear different ways it's done. 
Um, but I'll talk a few a little bit about these. There's Neighbor Ride, which is in Howard County, so right, you know, right down the road from us. They are a nonprofit, so they, you know, fundraise and they get some grants, but they actually charge five dollars a ride. So it's like they it's a little they basically supplement themselves from the riders. Now we all know five dollars is way less than it costs to give a ride. I mean, you're not talking gas or anything. So it's all volunteer drivers, but the riders pay five dollars per ride, basically just to keep the lights on and the you know the person answering the phone and to you know have some staff basically. So that's one model. It's called neighbor ride. They only serve Howard County, and I think they're only within Howard County. So it's a limited number of destinations. Um, our partner in Maryland is the Jewish Council on Jewish Council on Aging. Um, it's called Village Ride. And they're sort of like us in that they're a hub with spokes. They have a transportation hub and they have 15 partners, but their partners are all villages. So it's all membership based um, and they only do certain geographic areas. They're out of Montgomery County and Prince George's County. So they have two counties in Maryland they cover. This upper right corner, this little bus logo is called Herda, and I've worked with them a lot. They're in rural Iowa. I met them at a conference. And I was so interested because they are actually a public transportation group. They're a bus line for rural Iowa. But rural Iowa is huge and they don't go that many places. So they supplement their public transportation with volunteer drivers. And so their volunteer drivers will, you know, pick people up at a bus stop and then take them somewhere else because the distances are so huge. So it's kind of like their last mile is solved with volunteer drivers, um, but they use these they use buses. So it's a, it's kind of a patchwork. And I thought they were really interesting because they do a large number of rides, but they're doing them in tandem with the bus system. And I don't know that that's like the ideal model for Northern Virginia because we have pretty good public transportation, but it was an interesting idea that if, you know, you can't get rides covered that maybe doing that last mile helps. So I was fascinated by them. I've worked with them a lot because they've taught me some things about marketing and We've sort of gone back and forth. So they're a great resource. If anybody's starting, they, they know what they're doing. They're great. Um, and then ITN America, I'm sure if you've researched this space, they're the biggest player because they have their own proprietary software. They are a program founded by a woman in New Hampshire whose mother needed these programs. And you actually, when seniors want to stop driving, they trade in their car. So you give your vehicle as a donation to them. And then they use that money, like however value that is, as kind of your bank of to pay for volunteer rides. So then you get access to their volunteer rides program. Um, and then once you spend down the car, you have to pay a small amount per ride. But again, it's much less than you would pay. But it starts with trading in your car. Um, so it's a good way to kind of it's like a kind of a barter system, actually. And it's interesting. They, they use a credit system. So. They also have their own software to track this that's really beautiful and it's made on Salesforce. So, you know, it's nice, it's sleek. Um, so that's another model. So those are different models I've worked with. Like we do it our own way, but there's certainly no, it's not, it's not necessarily the right way. It's just the way it started here. So there's different ways of funding. I kind of mentioned it, but there's like membership and dues is one way, right? The villages do that. There's membership fees. There's grant funded. So people, you know, they have grant writers and they get a grant and use that money and then they apply for another grant and do it again. That's another way. There's usually grant cycles. Um, there's fee per rides. Like I mentioned, neighbor rides charges this pretty nominal fee for rides. Um, and then there's the barter system where people are essentially trading in their car to get rides. Um, so there's lots of ways to fund it. There's not one, you know, magic solution. I think it's good to think about all these ways as we try and be creative to make this happen. So there's a lot of toolkits out there that to start such programs. And I've worked with some of the authors before. If anyone's really interested, like I said, I'll send you my reading list. There's some great books on this. So Shepherd Center has a project turnkey. That's like a 90 page PDF you can access that tells you step one, step two, step three, how to do this. The Community Transportation Association of America has a very similar toolkit. Plus they have like a software comparison so you can really like shop your software. Um, locally, really cool in Woodbridge, and I've met with them before, um, is SEMA and VIS Insurance. They provide umbrella insurance and volunteer insurance at a really good rate. They're not very expensive, but they also 
are very nice to us in particular and have given us lots of advice on like risk, liability, training, et cetera. And they're just down the road in Woodbridge. So they're a really helpful resource. If you're local, I feel like I'm a good resource. I do this all day long. If you're not, I could probably find somebody because I'm in a couple groups. Uh, we have a YouTube channel that has driver training videos, which are really nice, I think, because it tells you, you know, what to do with someone who's confused or whatever. Uh, in the D.C. area, the Washington Area Village Exchange is a good resource, especially for starting a village, not just a driving program. Shepherd Center, Shepherd Center of America is a really good resource. They have a lot on how to start a Shepherd Center, how to do volunteer driving. And the Jewish Council on Aging in Maryland has a lot about um, aging in place as well. They have a connect a ride program. So they have different things that can kind of come together to help you make this work. So that's all I had. What questions did people have? What concerns, stories, anecdotes, feedback for me? Things you'd like to see NV Rides do in the future? Yeah, if people would like to pose that question verbally, just go ahead and unmute. Uh, otherwise, uh, continue to type in the chat. Uh, go ahead, Mr. Roney. Uh, yeah, Emily, thank you for the presentation. Um, just some kind of basic questions. I, I'm a recent retiree. I'm, I'm looking for ways to give back. And I thought that I might uh, volunteer for this program. I just wondered um, how, what kind of time commitment uh, you're looking for? Would we uh, necessarily uh, uh, sign up for certain days that we do this, or do we just kind of get on the program and look and see who needs a ride on the day that I'm available? Could you talk a little bit about how that works? Yeah, I'm super glad you mentioned that because that's a one of our, I think that's one of our biggest strengths as a volunteer organization. We are totally flexible. Um, none of our programs have driving minimums. We have people who've signed up and never driven and that's okay with us, right? It happens. Um, so when you sign up to be a driver, you undergo a background check and training. It's pretty simple. The background check is done via email. Um, you undergo some training, you know, they'll go over the basics, what to do, what not to do. Then you're entered in the database and you receive what we call the blast email, which is an email of all the available rides for a given interval of time. And you can accept them from your email. Now, if you are in Florida, I just let it pass you by. You can, you could let it go months, basically, as long as you're updating and staying in touch, like, Hey, here's my driver's license and insurance. Um, you could go, you know, you don't, there's no minimum commitment. So you could say, oh, I want to look, you know, a Tuesday in March and you can look and see what's available. It's not like, it's up to you. We always empower the drivers to pick, um, not the, not the riders. So it's up to you when you want to drive. Okay. And will you talk about how we can sign up for your program? Yes, that's, oh, that's great. Yeah. So you can email me at um, either email. I, I read both of them. <laughs> Um, emily.braley at the j.org or info at mvrides.org. And then I'll just get your information and send it to whichever is the most convenient like driving program in your area. We try and keep it very local. So if you live in like, you know, uh, Clifton, there's a program there, you know, you, we don't, you don't have to go really far and most of the trips are pretty close. I'm with you in Vienna. Oh, okay. So it's, it's Shepherd Center Oakton, Vienna. Um, if you shoot me an email after this, I'll get you over to the, them. I'm, I live very close. <laughs> Great. Thank you for the work that you're doing. It's, it's, uh, it's a wonderful contribution you're making. Thank you. Thank you so much. I appreciate that, Jack. Um, I thought I had another question in the chat and now, oh, here we go. Where do we start to volunteer in Northern Virginia? So yes, Colleen, it depends on where you live. It would be based on like your your zip code, basically. Um, I would get your information over to the local driving partner. They do a background check. You're on those emails and you're just accepting away as you as you wish, basically, from the emails. Um, and like I said, if you're away or anything like that, it's really nice because you don't have to like notify the volunteer that you're going to be, you know, in Texas for two months. You can just not sign up for rides for a little bit and, you know, it's okay. <laughs> anybody have any thoughts or things they, they things they want to share with me or questions I feel like I've covered a lot but sometimes you know you get a lot of info dump and then you have to process it oh it's Sarah Jack Roney again <laughs> oh I, yes go ahead if I uh, could ask a, just another kind of background question uh follow up on the one I asked earlier is it is it normal or expected that when we uh 
drop someone, take someone to the grocery store or a doctor's office or whatever, will we normally uh, be expected to go in with them, accompany them, or wait in the car? Or is it more typical that we'd come back later or somebody else would pick them up? What, what's the, the kind of typical uh, sort of procedure on that? I guess with some doctor's appointments, they could be in there for an hour or two. Um, and so I, I guess it's hard to predict uh, uh, in each case uh, how much time that would take. That's a good question. Ride scheduler will always have the estimate. So at least, you know, like it, 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 the right also ride scheduler is set up with it, where it will say if it's round trip or one way. So usually the coordinators will like, let's say it's something that's like six hours. Like the person is, you know, three doctor's appointments in the same building or something, then they'll often have it divided into two one way chunks. So you're not waiting for six hours. Sometimes it's like, oh, I need to get a lab drawn, like a blood draw, right? That's really fast. It'll be like, you know, it'll say it's round trip. Um, and it always gives a time estimate, like from the person. So if it's an hour of physical therapy, a lot of times for that, the driver will like read a book or whatever, or, you know, run an errand of their own. Um, but some for th certain things, I know for a fact, a lot of times grocery shopping, the drivers do it because, you know, why make an extra trip when you're there? Um, so it kind of depends on like what this, the request is for the most part, but the um, the medical ones, it's really how long it is and, and what the parking situation is. Thank you. Yeah, that's a good question. I think Sarah, wait, Sarah, oh. Sarah had her yeah. hand raised. Uh, yes, I'm here. Oh, hi, Sarah. Hi. Um, so I, at the beginning of the uh, talk, you talked about um, wanting to expand in the Route 1 High Bluff Valley area. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Who would be, is there already a, a, a partner in that area looking, looking to manage that or what? a good question. The answer is it's kind of complicated. So officially no right now, but uh, Shepherd Center Fairfax Park has been kind enough to go over there sometimes, but it's certainly not uh, a preponderance of our calls come from that area for some reason. I don't know if it's because it's maybe just really dense. A lot of people live there, I'm guessing. I don't know. Um, but so I, I I know that we, we we could better serve that area if we found an organization. Right now, it's not very well served. Okay. Thank yeah, you. but if you know of any organization, like I would love to like work with like a church or like a community center or something like that. Like we, you know, we do do rides there. I see them all the time, but it's, we could do a lot more there. There are a couple more questions that came up yeah. in the chat also. Um, okay, hold on a second. Let me go up for some reason. Okay, how long is training? So it's usually a couple hours, like one or two hours. And it can be, I do it a lot via Zoom. So it's pretty fast. Um, some places have you come in and they make a badge, which is also nice <laughs> just so you identify yourself. And maybe they'll get some of our organizations do car magnets where it says like volunteer driver on your you know bumper or whatever, just so the rider can see like the logo. Um, but it's not extremely, extremely detailed. The main thing is like go over the software, go over some basic rules, um, get a chance to log on and make sure everything works. Um, so it's not too time consuming. Like I said, we do do it on Zoom a lot. I suspect most attendees are potential volunteers and are interested and more focused on what it's like for volunteer. For example, you haven't talked much about the local organizations we must sign up with. Most may not be interested in how to organize a group. Maybe this could be a separate presentation. That's a great point. That is a great question. I didn't know exactly what the audience would be like. And it's cool that you guys are, um, somebody in uh, community resource says, I'm interested in starting a volunteer driving programs. I work for a senior center. So yeah, I think it's diverse. I think, so I, I'd love to talk about what it's like to volunteer. Um, Cause I, that's something I have a lot of knowledge about. Cause that's what I do most of the time. Um, so the local organizations are mostly geographic based. There are a few exceptions, which would be um, Dar al Hijra, which is a mosque. Um, and it's usually for their members. There's two synagogues, Agudis Achim and Temple Road of Shalom that generally are really just their members, but they do a lot, but generally those communities, everything else is geographically divided. So it would be like based on zip code for the most part. Um, so the way it works is volunteers either go to the organization or they go to me. I get the information and I, I say, hi, I'm the umbrella organization. I'm gonna pass your information to you know, wherever your zip code is. That organization will then like run your background check. They'll go through their training. They'll give you a badge and a magnet if applicable to identify yourself. 
Um, and then once you're a volunteer, it's really just looking at your emails and deciding like if you want to take that ride or not. Like it's completely up to you. Um, the ride scheduler software, you can log on to a website and really dig around, but you can also just get the emails and there's an accept button in the email. So if you get an email that's like, oh yeah, that's really convenient. I'm going there anyways, you can click yes. Um, and like I said, if you're out of town or whatever, you can just let them kind of pass by. And then when you're available again, you can start picking them up. There's no like minimum or maximum. I know people who drive every day and then some people drive like just, you know, once or twice in a month, once or twice in every few months. Um, some people only like certain destinations, which is great. If you want to, you know, if you're a grocery run person and that's all you want to do, that's fine. There's always something and the rides are available generally at least Monday through Friday, if not more. We have some weekend grocery runs and stuff, um, some church services. So Maximum, yeah, I know we stay pretty drive busy. Day, and then some people drive like just, you know, once or twice a um, month, once or twice in every few months. If anyone, um, so Jan. Only like certain destinations, which is great. If you want to, you know, if you're a grocery run person and that's all you want to do, that's fine. Okay, I'm sorry. I'm getting uh, generally, audio coming through. Uh, so I'll go ahead and stop that. Sorry, go ahead. No problem. Jan in the chat says, if anyone lives in Prince William County is interested in volunteering, you can contact me. She put her email there. Jan is one of our partners, volunteer Prince William. It's so nice to see you on here, Jan. Um, Jan organizes all of this for Prince William County. So if you're a Prince William County person, please join us via Jan. Or if you email me, I'll immediately forward it to Jan because <laughs> we email a lot. Um, uh, Barbara says, I'm also in the Route 1 area. If you don't have a partner here, how do we volunteer? So Shepherd Center, Fairfax, Burke would still be, they do do rides there. Um, they are 100% the partner there. It's just that the, the numbers are so much higher than we could, the, the demand is very high there. Um, and so I think they've, you know, they haven't officially moved in there. Um, but yes, if you're in the Route 1 area, Shepherd Center, Fairfax, Burke does do rides there. And I'd be happy to help you uh, work with them. The area around Fort Belvoir, they do rides a lot. I've actually gone to a lot of events on Fort Belvoir um, and had great success and it's a lot of fun over there. So we definitely do it. It's just that um, officially, I don't think they've opened the floodgates because there's there would be so many riders. <laughs> um, but yes, they do operate there all the time. Shepherd Center, Fairfax, Burke. They have a South County location and a one-off Ollie Lane, very close to Ollie actually spelled differently, EY. Um, and then who, I don't know who, I, I'd love to know who community resources is, who is interested in starting a volunteer driving program? Cause I don't think I've met you before or I don't, I don't recognize your Zoom name. <laughs> oh, it's Joe from Cincinnati, Ohio. Okay, cool. Hi, nice to meet you. I've not met you before. Um, Cool. Yeah. So that yeah, we definitely volunteer rides programs all over the country. We are growing movement. I feel like I've talked to people from all different states who've done it and they're all different. They all operate differently. We had a graduate student. Some of you all might have heard the story from a PhD student from Texas who studied our program about two years ago and she's starting one in Texas. And it looks so different than ours and it's totally inspired by ours so i think it, they sort of just take on the character of the community they're in to some degree um because she operates very differently than we do and it's it's great it's it's working um so we we know that there's different ways to do it it's really about getting people where they need and creating the connections and it's there's lots of ways to do it so does anybody else have anything they want to add or comment on or questions, concerns, comments, feedback, letter to the editor. <laughs> awesome. Well, it was a pleasure speaking with you all. Um, if, if anybody has anything else to add, you know, I'm always available via email and maybe I'll meet you at a farmer's market when the weather's warmer. Have a great day, everybody. Happy Friday.